world of the circus, these people, under the blast of a spotlight, transform themselves. And in short, they become demigods. And once the light's cut, are condemned as parasites. And I am going to introduce you to these worlds of blood and sweat and sequins. Good evening. Well, before I was offered a job as a dancer in a Mexican circus, Don Humberto, who was the boss, he was the empresario, told me about his life, about the hunger and the hardship of his childhood in the circus in the 1930s. He told me about the time he'd met Elizabeth Taylor and the amazing sexual chemistry that he'd had with her, about how he'd flirted with her right underneath Richard Burton's nose. <laughs> he told me how the Pope himself had complimented him on his miraculous ability to defy death twice nightly. And then he told me about how recently his niece had been eaten by one of his tigers, and that his brother had lost most of his fingers trying to prise her decapitated head out from the cat's jaws. And then he told me that he was one performer short. <laughs> and it was then that he asked me that one crucial, life-changing question. And it was whether I still wanted the job. <laughs> so I am going to take you to the circus in Mexico. These art forms, these social phenomenons, are as ancient as human civilization itself because our archives and our museums are bursting with records and reminders of Egyptian acrobats or Mexican aerialists. These people all exist within the same social paradox. These people live in trailers, they live in favelas, they live in slums, but yet under the blast of a spotlight, they transform themselves. They perform these acts of incredible grace and strength and illusion. And in short, they become demigods. And it is because of this phenomenon that these same people, once the light's cut, are condemned as parasites, prostitutes, and pariahs because through this act of transformation, they are enacting an insurrectional threat to society. And I know that part of my own interest in these worlds was purely voyeuristic. I wanted to know what the lives of these people were like after the lights cut and after they scrubbed off their painted blushes. And I'm going to introduce you to their lives. But before I do that, I must tell you why I joined the circus in the first place. Because when I was young, I wanted to be a trapeze artist. But when we are little, we are wiser than we will ever be as adults, because we believe that anything is possible. And I was lucky enough to do exactly what I was expected to do, as most people do, up to a point. Because after I got my university degree, I graduated into the recession. And over eight months, all I accumulated was a stack of rejection letters. So after a while, I realized that actually it was a sign that my only option was to cut my losses and to do what I'd always wanted to do, and to join the circus. So I made a beeline for Mexico City, because Mexico is rumored to host more circuses than any other country in the world. Over 200 I said to pitch in the capital city alone. Now, once I entered the world of the circus, I learned how to survive in this world. I learned how to French kiss tigers. I learned how to unravel my fishnets without laddering them. I learned how to dodge bullets. And I learned how to look nonchalant after flushing a quantity of cocaine down a public lavatory. 
But one of the most important things that I learned was how to belong in this world. The girls that I encountered were competitive and bitchy. And ultimately, they became my best friends. And what surprised me about the time that I spent in the circus was how many empty hours there were to fill. And many of these empty hours were spent debating in all seriousness where the various men in the circus ranked on a scale of 1 to 10. <laughs> but many of these same empty hours would often be filled with less innocent pursuits. Because it makes sense that if these guys are walking tightropes in the ring, if they're dicing with death every night, then these same adrenaline junkies will be getting their kicks backstage through similar means. So let me tell you about this, this photograph, because this is Perla. And this guy is Perla's best friend's boyfriend. As I said, people dice with death in their social lives. And it seemed rare for a week to go by without a colossal scandal that would shake the world of the circus. And I had to find myself a boyfriend, because otherwise, the girls would consider me a liability like Perla here. And the guys in the circus would consider me a target. So I started going out with this guy, Seth, who is a seventh generation circus performer. He had grown up sleeping with three tigers in his bed. He could speak five languages. He could speak English, Spanish, French, German, Italian, six languages, and Russian. And yet he couldn't read or write because he'd never gone to school. He spent a few years when he was little, living in a brothel after he'd been abandoned there. But when he was old enough to train as a trapeze artist, he was taken back into the circus. And he went on to become one of the best performers that the trapeze world has ever had. He's the only person to complete the quadruple somersault on the trapeze, one of the only people. And he had lived nine lives. He had a skull full of metal plate. He had been shot. He'd been a crack addict since he was 13, and an alcoholic since he was 10. Although my relationship with Seth didn't last, my relationship with the circus has. Over the years, I've gone back, and I've gone back three times. This girl in the middle here, her name is Cynthia. And like me, she came from an academic middle class family. She didn't decide that she wanted to be a dancer in the circus until she'd completed her PhD in philosophy. <laughs> this guy here is called Marco, and he also wasn't born into the world of the circus. But when he was very little, he told his parents that he wanted to grow up to be a performer, and that he also wanted to grow up to become a girl. At the age of 18, he was already smashing records as a hula hoop artist. And although he was still performing as Marco in the ring, he was taking sex change hormones and liked to be called Justine backstage. But interlopers like Cynthia and like Marco and like myself aside, the world of the circus is dominated by just a handful of families intimately connected with each other. Being born into the circus entitles you to become part of this vast international community and to make your home in any troupe, anywhere in the world. But there are also other things which distinguish life as a child in the circus. Now, I have a baby, and he's, he's just over one year old. But by the time he was just about learning to sit up, my friend's baby, who was born a few days before him, was already performing in the ring on the back of a horse. But children like Anhil here, or like Fatima, the electrician's daughter, have childhoods that are distinct from children like this little girl in the audience. Because instead of being brought up to be told to watch out and to be careful, they are brought up being taught that their livelihood depends on their ability to take risks and to be brave and to believe that anything is possible. And in short, to believe in magic. 
this girl here is called Chanel. She'd already performed in more countries than she could count on her fingers. And she was training as a contortionist. I got to see this little girl, Nicole, who's six, perform for the first time in the ring and to become a star of the show. She was doing an act which her mother had done when she was a little girl. She was performing on the aerial hoop. And I saw this little boy messing around under the awnings of the big tent, and I thought he was just having fun. Until I saw the expression on his face when he entered the ring for the first time. I saw the seriousness of his face, and I realized that he hadn't been messing around. He'd been preparing in deadly earnest for one of the most life-transforming moments of his career. Now, there is another one of those unspoken, unwritten rules, which is felt very deeply by circus empresarios. And it is that at every new town that they performed in, they invite the children from the local orphanage to come and see the show for free. Not as a form of entertainment, but as a lesson in just how far a handful of sequins and imagination and creativity and a spotlight can take you from the difficult nature of your everyday life. These guys here in this photo are riggers, and their jobs were hand-blisteringly hard. They were responsible for throwing up and for taking down the big tops overnight, and they would often be left exhausted and thick with dirt before their jobs were halfway done. But they took this work for very little money because circus offered them something much, much more than employment. It offered them a sense of belonging. It offered them a sense of identity. It gave them a family. Now, as well as learning to fit in with the people in the circus, I had to learn how to fit in with the animals because these people's livelihoods didn't just depend upon their relationships with their creatures. Their lives did as well. Let me introduce you to Dumbo, for example. Now, when I first joined the circus, Dumbo was an elderly elephant. But she'd actually been a 12th birthday present to Umberto Sanjijo after he'd broken his back on the trapeze. But as I said, by the time I joined the circus, Dumbo was elderly, and she had dreadful PMS. She used to get horrendous hormonal moods. And of course, she used to become a liability when she got angry. And there was only one guy in the circus who could cope with her. His name was Tesoro, and he'd been a member of the Marisalva Trucha. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, after the Civil War in El Salvador, the country broke out into explosive gang violence. And to become a member of the Marisalva Trucha gang, you have to murder someone. Now, Tesoro had murdered four people. He had four tears tattooed on his face, one for each of the people who he'd killed. And possibly because of his past, he didn't seem to be able to communicate with people very well. But he did have these extraordinary, unique relationships with the animals. And so he was a go-to guy when Dumbo got moody. And he used to go, and he used to lie next to her in the straw. And he used to roll a spliff. And he used to sing her lullabies. And whether it was the marijuana, or whether it was the sound of his voice, it used to do the trick. I told you that this is a world which deals with appearances and disappearances. And the first time that I went back to the circus in Mexico, to maintain my relationship with that world, I discovered that many of the people who I, known, who, who I had known had disappeared. So Seth, the boyfriend that I had, had been murdered. And Tesoro, that guy who'd sung lullabies to the elephant, was in jail. And the elephant herself had died 
of a brain aneurysm, although people in the circus said that she died of a broken heart because she'd been a week in retirement and thought that no one wanted to see her act anymore. And what I realized at that point was that the lives of these people are br bloody and brutal, and often they're all too short. But yet these are the same people who can make an act which lasts for just five minutes under the spotlight, twirl and flip through the imagination of their audience for nights to come. And I started this talk tonight thinking about why the circus and the carnivalesque and magic and masquerade are forms which are as ancient as human civilization itself. And I realize that it's through making these acts which penetrate and permeate the human imagination that these people become immortal, or at least they become unforgettable. And they force us, they challenge us to think just how different our own lives could be if we worked on the basis that they do, that anything is possible for our own selves and that we are only limited by our imaginations. Now, thank you, that's, that's the end of my presentation.